Hi, I'd like to talk about Haswhopper today. Um, I think there's a lot of uh, confusion, a lot of misunderstanding within industry about what Haswhopper means, who is required to have it, the different levels of training and stuff like that. So we'll spend a few minutes talking about Haswhopper here today. Haswhopper stands for Hazardous Waste Operations and Emergency Response. It is covered in OSHA 1910-120. Um, that's where it goes through all the training requirements, who can do the training, um, what kind of training is required, all that kind of stuff. All right, so we'll cover some of that here today. Haswhopper came about um, basically after World War II. Um, you know, we were finding we had a lot of uh, um, military and industry had a lot of uh, chemicals and stuff like that that uh, needed guidance on how to clean it up and manage those waste sites. And then also we saw industry, especially in the 1950s, 60s, um, improperly disposing of a lot of waste. Not illegal at that time yet because we didn't have all the laws that, that really defined how hazardous waste could be disposed of. Um, but we were seeing incidents like, for example, Love Canal near Niagara Falls, uh, where chemicals were being disposed of improperly. Um, that led to a lot of consequences for, for children and families. Um, having to relocate homes and stuff like that. And then Valley of the Drums, which was a huge hazardous waste site um, that was in a valley where thousands of drums of chemicals started leaking and affecting groundwater and stuff like that. Um, also in Bhopal, India, um, there was a release um, of a gas that killed thousands of people, citizens in a city. Um, so Haswhopper kind of came about um, as a result of some of those incidents that, that affected um, greatly a lot of people's lives. Um, so basically what Haswhopper, um, two different types of facilities really need to have Haswhopper. One is going to be your um, like hazardous waste cleanup facilities. So if you have a, a you know, a, a hazardous waste dump or someplace like that, or maybe a place that uh, is a SARA site, a Superfund um, amendment site, where there's hazardous waste there that's being cleaned up or restored, um, that would be the hazardous waste operations part. The uh, emergency response would be if you have a facility um, that has chemicals with the potential for a, a release, um, for example, um, refrigeration. If you have a warehouse or food manufacturing or a facility like that that has a lot of anhydrous ammonia, Right, if there's an anhydrous ammonia release, most fire departments are not um, hazmat technicians, so they might go in and do a rescue if somebody's down, but they do not have the capability to go in there and actually shut that leak down. So they're going to isolate, evacuate, and isolate your site until an actual hazmat team gets to your facility. Um, not all states operate quite on that model, but uh, for example, where I live in Albert Lee, Minnesota, our nearest hazmat team is at least an hour away. So if a facility did have a leak, it would be over an hour before another fire department could come in and actually go into that scene and shut that leak down. So that's a large release and that's gonna have a major impact on the environment. Um, citations and stuff are gonna be increased for that company potentially. And just a lot more um, expenses as far as, as how much chemical that company is gonna lose. For example, anhydrous ammonia, all right? So if a company has an emergency response team, um, those employees are going to be trained to actually um, wear the correct PPE, the hazmat suit, the respirators, uh, you know, the SBA respirator and stuff like that, so that they can actually have the training and the capability to go into that site and shut down that leak. So they don't have to sit there and wait until the fire department shows up and clears that scene themselves. All right. Um, NFPA 472 also has a standard on uh, on these uh, hazmat emergency response operations. Um, and the major difference there is NFPA 472 is going to be recognized in different countries. All right. So if I'm a hazmat technician under NFPA standard, I can go to Canada and they're still going to recognize that certification. If I'm certified as a Haswhopper techni a, um, hazmat technician under, under the OSHA Haswhopper standard, for example, OSHA is specific to the United States. So I can't go to Canada and take that certification with me that I've been through that class as a technician, right? Canada is not going to recognize OSHA. So that's one major advantage to, 
to uh, being a hazmat technician under NFPA standard. All right. So what's the difference between um, the different levels of hazmat training? Well, first of all, you have the eight hour awareness class. Um, so awareness is it's only going to be training on recognizing an emergency. Um, so so an employee that has that, they might recognize that there's a chemical release, maybe identifying what that chemical is. And about all they can do is initiate the evacuation and do completely hands off um, things like that. You know, they're pulling the alarm, um, calling 911, stuff like that. All right. Uh, next, we're going to have operations. Um, operations can do a little more hands on, um, but about the extent that they can do is going in to actually perform a rescue and getting out. So they have to, if somebody's down, they have to suit up, grab that person, get out. Um, they might be able to shut down a leak remotely. For example, if it's a refrigeration system and they can work from a computer to shut valves, um, but they cannot enter that scene where they're going to be exposed to that chemical to shut down leaks. All right. Um, the next level is going to be a technician. Now, a technician can actually go in and get hands-on. So if you have a pipe leaking or a tank that's ruptured or something like that, they're actually going to suit up have their SCBA on underneath that hazmat suit um, and they can actually go in and get dirty, right? They can shut that leak down. And the next level is going to be specialist, all right? A hazmat specialist, um, they're going to have training that's above and beyond um, what the OSHA um, HazWhopper standard teaches. They might have, for example, um, they might be have a chemistry engineer degree. Um, they might have advanced training in refrigeration and stuff like that. So they're going to have advanced knowledge that's really going to give them the capability to understand the chemicals in that facility. All right. Now, just because somebody's trained to one level in another facility, um, that might not always translate. For example, um, so let's say I was I was I had advanced training in um, in anhydrous ammonia refrigeration. I understood that chemical inside and out. I had a lot of training and I had the Hazwopper training to be technician or above. Now let's say I went to another facility where they have a totally different set of chemicals um, and I, I don't have the training um, to understand all those chemicals and how they react. I might I can be considered a specialist in the first facility where I have that advanced training to understand that but I might not be a specialist in the other facility, all right? Um, however, usually if I've had a uh, the 24 or 40 hour technician training in one facility, that um, certification does follow me to another another facility, all right? So specialist may not follow depending on what the, uh, what the circumstances are. All right, typically a hazmat technician or operations level person is gonna have at least 24 hours of training under HazWopper. Um, preferably 40. So if they're going to be a supervisor or something like that, they should have the 40 hour training. Um, but the standard really goes through um, who can do what, uh, what levels of training and stuff like that. Um, but they do leave some of that up to the facility, whoever is managing that program. So that person has to use their discretion um, and they shouldn't really just uh, wing it, right? Really know what kind of training do your people need? What kind of training have they had? and what kind of hazards are they dealing with. All right, to be a technician or operations level, um, you're gonna have a lot of training in hazmat suits. So the level A, B, C, or D. Um, so deciding what kind of suit you're gonna wear. Um, being able to understand those chemicals as far as being able to read the SDS, recognizing the hazards, recognizing the signs of that uh, chemical, um, and then being able to, to select the correct PPE and actions based on that. Um, also they're going to have training in air monitoring. Um, so how to use the four gas monitor or the different specific uh, monitors, um, specific to their facility, um, pH monitoring, um, using test strips or however they're going to be testing that. Um, and a lot of different information, incident command, um, decon or decontamination, um, all those kind of things that are going to go with actually going into that facility and performing those actions. So who can train? Um, I do a lot of HazWopper training. Um, OSHA doesn't have a certification, so I can't just take a class and say, okay, I'm certified by OSHA to take this class because I have the certification. It doesn't work that way. 
Um, there are train the trainer for Haswhopper, but that's not a certification. That's basically a good background, right? Um, for me personally, um, really what, what uh, designates me as a trainer or what um, gives me the background to be able to do that is I'm a firefighter and I've had uh, um, firefighting one and two training and a lot of other hazmat training. I've, I've gone out to, for example, the uh, um, National Fire Academy out in Emmitsburg, Maryland. I've had a two-week hazmat class and stuff like that. So looking at your individual trainer, and they should have the, the background knowledge to be able to teach what they're teaching, both on the how to teach side. Um, so, for example, how to teach people, how to administer tests and stuff like that. And then the actual hazmat and OSHA training. All right. So OSHA does not have a designation saying who can train. Um, they're not going to sign off on anybody. Basically, that's up for the employer to decide who is who has the uh you know, qualifications to do that training. All right, every year then after that, you have to do uh, a refresher training. Um, that doesn't necessarily have to be eight hours, but eight hours is kind of that standard, right? Um, that's what most people follow. You don't have to do it all at once. Um, so there's nothing saying that you have to have a, a one eight hour class per year. Um, my preference is actually stretching that out over the year because people don't tend to remember everything over the course of a year. So maybe it's every quarter you're having a two hour, two or three hour training um, where you're maybe doing a drill and just going over some of that stuff. That way you're not sitting in a classroom for a full eight hours, right? Um, so because it's being spread out, um, they're gonna remember it better and they're not gonna have that the, the boredom of being in an eight hour class, right? Um, so there's a, a lot of things that come with uh, Haswhopper. So um, if you're looking for an instructor, I'd be happy to help you out there. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, that's probably my favorite class to teach is the Haswhopper class, taking somebody that, uh, a group of employees that really have no background in emergency response and over the course of a week or so, getting them trained up to the ability to actually go out and do that kind of work, being a technician in their facility. Um, it's fun. I think there's a lot of learning that goes on. We keep people engaged. They're gonna learn a lot about chemistry. Um, it's going to be hands-on, so um, be happy to help you out there. If you have any Haswhopper questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you very much, and have a good day.